Every artifact found by an archaeologist, or anybody else for that matter, is a physical link to the past. It's a chance to learn more about our ancient ancestors and develop a connection with the people and places that existed on this earth long before we did. That's why we're all fascinated by history. We hope you find this video as fascinating to watch as we did to make it for you. What do you give to a military leader who's just successfully led the single biggest combat operation in the history of Great Britain? Well, if you're anything like the ancient Romans, you give him a solid bronze hand of the kind that was found close to Hadrian's Wall in 2018. The hand dates back to the time of a massive Roman incursion into Scotland in the year 210, which saw 50,000 Roman soldiers entering the country and battle all the way up to Aberdeen, slaying thousands of native Scottish tribespeople in the process. This was a particularly important war for the Romans, so much so that Emperor Septimius Severus led the army personally. He believed that the chiefs of these Scottish tribes had backed out of a peace agreement, so he went there to teach them a lesson they would never forget. It's unclear whether the hand was left behind by accident or if it was buried as a way of giving thanks to Roman war gods after the conflict was over. If it was the latter, then it's one of the countless similar votive offerings at Vendolanda. Hemmerberg in southern Austria attracts visitors for various reasons, including its stone churches, thermal hot springs with reputed healing properties, and intriguing archaeological finds. Among the discoveries at Hemmerberg, archaeologists unearthed a burial site from the early medieval period that contained a remarkable burial. The grave belonged to a middle-aged man from the 6th century CE and stood out due to an extraordinary feature, a prosthetic device replacing his left foot and ankle. The man's skeleton was found fully intact, except for the replaced limb. The surviving evidence suggests that humans have been using prosthesis for thousands of years, with some Egyptian mummies and Roman graves revealing early examples. The Hemmerberg prosthetic, estimated to be around 1,500 years old, has deteriorated over time, leaving behind an iron ring and dark staining on the lower leg bones, possibly from a leather pouch used to secure the device. The rarity of prosthetic finds in the archaeological record can be attributed to the challenges of surviving amputations in the pre-antibiotic eras. The man's amputation and the functionality provided by the prosthetic during that time period offer intriguing insights into ancient medical practices and the resilience of individuals in overcoming physical challenges. For the past few years, archaeologists have been hard at work excavating the ancient Turkish city of Satala. They've uncovered several treasures during that time and got the latest reward for their efforts in early June 2022. It came in the shape of a bronze Arashian belt. The belt would have belonged to an Arashian warrior who lived somewhere between 2600 and 2900 years ago and is unique despite there only being fragments of it left. The surviving pieces which were found within an elaborate tomb can easily be identified as Urashian because of the images of the Urashian god Haldi that are etched into its surface. It would have been considered an excellent discovery no matter where it was found, but the location of the discovery is important. This is the first evidence that the borders of the ancient Urashian kingdom extended all the way north to Gumashane. Prior to the discovery, historians were confident that the kingdom stopped short of the Black Sea region, but now they're going to have to reconsider that stance. We often say the best discoveries are those that challenge our understanding of history, and this is a perfect example. During this season's excavations at the Roman fort of Vendolanda, yes, that's right, we're going back to the Vendolanda, volunteer archaeologists have made an exciting discovery. It's a silver phalera featuring the head of Medusa. Phalera were disc-shaped ornaments worn on the breastplate by Roman soldiers during parades. And this particular one showcases the terrifying visage of Medusa with her serpent hair and enchanting eyes. The find adds to the rich archaeological heritage of Vendolanda, which saw the construction of nine timber or stone forts from around the years 85 to 370. The site, located near Hadrian's Wall in Britain, offers valuable insights into frontier life and has yielded remarkable artifacts such as well-preserved shoes, textiles, wooden objects, 
and the famous Vendelanda tablets, the oldest surviving documents in Britain. In addition to these silver phalera, this season's excavations have unveiled further evidence of military life, including lance and spearheads, pottery, a bead, a bow brooch, a copper alloy scabbard shape, and a remarkably preserved wooden bath cloth. These intriguing discoveries are currently undergoing preservation in the Vindolanda Lab and will be showcased in the upcoming 2024 exhibition of current finds. When you apply gold gilding to an object, you instantly make it more valuable and ostentatious. When our ancient ancestors applied gold plating to their clothing or accessories, they generally did so to make themselves appear more important. With that in mind, we can only assume that the owner of these gilt bronze shoes had a very high opinion of themselves. The shoes were found during the excavation of a chamber tomb in Naju, South Korea in October 2014. The identity of the tomb's occupant is unknown, but he lived here during the Bakji Kingdom period and was laid to rest during the 7th century. Aside from being gold-plated, the shoes are decorated with dragon, lotus, and goblin designs, they're wonderful to look at, but must surely have been impractical to wear. Historians haven't ruled out the possibility that they were created specifically for the burial. Other grave goods found inside the same tomb include earrings, ceramics, stone pillows, a harness, and arrowheads. It's clear that this must have been a person of great importance, so it's frustrating that nothing with an inscription that might identify them was left behind before the tomb was sealed. We're staying in England because a remarkable horde of Roman pewter has been unearthed in Euston, Western Suffolk, shedding light on communal dining practices and possibly Christian symbolism during the 4th century. Discovered by metal detectorist Martin White during a detecting rally in September 2022, the hoard consists of a stack of plates and platters accompanied by smaller bowls and a cup. Fused together due to corrosion, the delicate vessels required careful separation and conservation by Suffolk County Council archaeologists. The main stack revealed five nested plates and platters, while adjacent groups contained bowls and dishes, some displaying intricate decorations and relief designs. The octagonal rims on two bowls suggest a possible Christian reference, but more research will have to be done before that can be confirmed. Although not considered official treasure due to pewter's non-precious metal status, the hoard holds immense archaeological value. As the owner of the Euston estate, the Duke of Grafton generously donated the hoard to the West Stow Anglo-Saxon Village and Museum, where it's now on display until January 2024. This significant discovery provides insights into Roman dining customs and cultural influences during the era. Picture this. In the quiet halls of a museum, a striking object demands your attention. A six-foot-tall red cape entirely made of bird feathers. As you approach, you realize it was meticulously crafted by tying thousands of individual feathers together using a fine rope, creating a dense yet supple net. The label reveals that it's a Tupinamba feather cape from 17th century Brazil made by indigenous people using feathers and vegetable fibers. However, the information provided is comparatively vague compared to Western works. Only 11 such capes from the 16th and 17th centuries exist today, all held in European collections. These remarkable artifacts raise intriguing questions about their purpose the perception of the Tupinamba people, their journey to Europe, and the ideal museum setting for them. European observers from that era describe feather objects as luxury garments for special occasions in combat. However, modern research suggests that the Tupinamba understood feather capes within a religious and shamanistic context, viewing birds as sacred beings that connected the material and immaterial worlds. For the Tupinamba, wearing feather garments transformed them into bird-like creatures, invoking powerful forces through rituals. The value of the cape lay not only in its craftsmanship, but also in its ritual use and the intricate relationships between humans, animals, and the natural world. This small offering table measuring approximately 10 by 4 inches comes with a storied and significant history from ancient Egypt. 
unearthed during W.M. Flinder Petrie's excavations at Gurab, an ancient complex that housed royal women and children during the New Kingdom period of around 1400 to 1200 BCE. It offers intriguing insights into the lives of Queen Tai and Amenhotep III. The inscriptions on the table reveal that Queen Tai resided at Gorub as the Queen Mother after her husband's passing, and the hieroglyphic inscriptions express offerings to Osiris, the reverend ruler of the West and ruler of eternity, on behalf of Amenhotep's royal life force. Notably, Queen Tai dedicated the table to her brother, her beloved, the perfect god. This remarkable object sheds light on the religious beliefs and customs of the time, while also symbolizing the enduring presence of Amenhotep III's royal life force through his still-living wife. Discovered at Gurub, this offering table serves as a tangible connection to the fascinating world of ancient Egypt and the intricate relationships between mortals and the divine. It also reminds us that there's still much we don't understand about ancient Egyptian religion. The Wound Man is a famous surgical diagram that originated in the 14th and 15th centuries in European medical manuscripts. It served as a visual guide to various injuries and diseases, directing readers to the corresponding treatments within the accompanying text. The diagram gained wider circulation when it was included in the Venetian Fascaculus Medicinae, one of the first printed medical miscellanies in Europe, in 1491. It continued to appear in printed books until the 17th century and has since become a recognizable figure in popular culture. The Wound Man illustration depicts a person with a multitude of injuries including cuts, bruises, rashes, thorn scratches, and venomous animal bites. The figure's transparent abdomen features schematic outlines of several organs. In earlier versions, numbers and phrases surrounded the figure, indicating where to find specific procedures in the accompanying treaties. Despite the depicted injuries, the Wound Man stands defiantly alive emphasizing its purpose of explaining and glorifying the available cures and medical treatments. The diagram has been referenced in various forms of popular culture, including the novel Red Dragon by Thomas Harris and the TV series Hannibal. It's also used as a supporter in the heraldic achievement of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. The Charlemagne Chessmen are a collection of 11th century ivory chess pieces housed in Paris, France. Originally consisting of 30 pieces, only 16 have survived since the French Revolution. Alongside the Louis Chessmen, they're considered among the most significant medieval chess sets in the world. These well-preserved figures provide a glimpse into the High Middle Ages. According to legend, the Chessmen were a gift from Caliph Harun al-Rashid to Charlemagne although they were actually created much later. Estimated to have been crafted in Salerno, Italy between 1050 and 1100, the chessmen feature intricate carvings and stand up to six inches tall. The kings weigh nearly two and a half pounds. Some of the figures still bear traces of red paint. Among the notable pieces are four elephants representing what would be considered bishops in modern chess terminology, the human figures are dressed in Norman-style attire, combining European, Arabic, Islamic, and Byzantine artistic influences. Surviving pieces include kings, queens, rooks, knights, bishops, and a pawn. A separate large elephant piece, known as the Elephant of Charlemagne, is also included with the set, but isn't thought to be a game piece. Its purpose is unknown. In July 2020, a Norwegian archaeology student out on a field visit with their tutor discovered the first evidence of a remote Viking trading station in the country, one that's forced Norwegian historians to reconsider the Viking Age history of their nation. The existence of the previously unknown station in Jesland is evidenced by coins, jewelry, silver, gold, and artifacts from Asia, Finland, and the British Isles. There are even a few Arabic coins at the site, which further underlines how far and wide the Vikings traveled and traded. Northern Norway isn't traditionally thought of as a hive of Viking activity, and yet this was clearly a major trading center during the 9th century. There's evidence of Viking agricultural and fishing centers elsewhere in northern Norway, but they tend to be further to the west and arrived many years later. 
This new site, which is known as the Sandorg, therefore becomes the oldest known trading place anywhere in the country's north, and the entire history of Viking trading behavior in the region has to be reevaluated. It might even be the case that the Vikings who later populated France and the British Isles set off from here. We sometimes say on this channel that you never know what you might find in your backyard. And this discovery is exactly what we mean by that statement. In March 2022, Mark Lake found an ancient Coast Salish war club in his backyard in Royston on Vancouver Island. At first glance, he thought it was nothing more than a piece of wood sticking out from beneath his maple tree. But his knowledgeable friends told him to take the object to Chief Nicole Rempel of the Kaamak's First Nation. It was there that the truth was discovered. This is the only artifact of its kind that's ever been discovered completely intact. Rather than being made from wood, the club is made of soft stone. The precise age of the club isn't yet known, but the Salish people have been living in British Columbia for around 10,000 years. There are around 25,000 of them still living today, but knowledge of their history and culture has mostly been passed down verbally with little in the way of writing or genuine historical artifacts to link the modern-day Salish to their ancient ancestors. This club is a tiny but vital piece of their history. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching.